going to hear from Luke. Luke has a question about becoming a salesperson or transitioning into being a professional salesperson, uh, which is kind of always kind of a bummer for me to hear. But before we get into that, we're going to kick it off with the question from Luke. Hey, Brian, my name's Luke. I was wondering if you had any advice for field technicians, installers, or service guys looking to step into a sales role. What's one thing you would relay to them to make their experience more successful? Okay, so gotcha, Luke. Um, good question. It is one that comes up quite often. And again, I said I don't love it because I, I really want to see more people on tools and fewer people off of tools. But I think there are some really good ways that this can be done. And there are a lot of different reasons why people would want to get into sales. Frankly, the number one reason is because salespeople tend to be paid by some form of commission. And so the opportunity for earning is a, put a lot more in your own hands. And a lot of times salespeople make a lot more money. Let's be real honest. Uh, not my favorite reason. One of my favorite reasons is, is that you really enjoy uh, the human interaction part. You enjoy that human connection part. So I often use Tyler, who's our uh, head residential sales guy, as an example. Um, he just really loves people. He really enjoys people. He likes talking to people. He doesn't get stressed out or worn out by having to talk on the cell phone or show up and talk to people all day, every day. That doesn't bother him. And I think that's a really good reason to be in sales. And that's what makes him a really good salesperson. But let's talk through some of the things that I think you really should do if you do want to make that transition. And uh, also going to encourage you not to rush it. If you really love fixing machines and that's primarily what you like doing, well, just keep doing that, right? I mean, you can make really good money doing that as well. Maybe if you are capped, maybe there are some new things you should be learning. But I would encourage you to consider not just running into sales because the money seems like it's better. And again, there's nothing wrong with making more money so that you can support your family and do what you want to do with it. It's your life. But I would always say if you really like the machines and the technology and all that stuff, maybe don't go to sales until you maybe get to a career point where you're ready to start to transition out of the field and then uh, maybe cons consider it. But again, not telling you what to do. The question was, how do you do it? So I'm going to talk to you about that. The first thing is learning how to have money conversations. Now, again, for good salespeople, it is not all about money, but it is completely undisputed that to be a good salesperson, you have to know how to have money conversations. You have to be able to establish budget with a customer. You can't feel so empathetic that you can't let big numbers spill out of your mouth or onto the paper. Um, you see a lot of people, a lot of technicians especially, who kind of do this like they're afraid to hand the invoice over or the proposal because they don't want to see the, the suffering in the client's eyes. You have to learn how to do that. And you have to learn how to do it with confidence and feel confident about what it is you're charging. Uh, if you don't do that, then you're going to always struggle. Now, I am not in any way giving excuses for this sort of new modern paradigm where people, where people charge absolutely exorbitant rates for things and they're you know coached. Uh, by bros with flat bills telling them that they should never be ashamed of what they're doing. There are times that you should be ashamed. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the regular drumbeat and transactions associated with good business. You have to get comfortable doing it. And some of the best ways to do that is to practice. And role playing is one of the easiest ways. Friends, family, other people at work, just role play those conversations until you've gotten some reps because it's always going to be obnoxious the first time you do it. It's like the first time you record a podcast or any audio where you hear your voice. You're going to absolutely hate how you sound. It's just how it is. And so you've got to get some reps in. You've got to get some confidence with that, talking about money, rehearsing objections, the objections that people make towards a sale, and knowing how to answer those questions without being defensive or pushy. Neither one of those um, do I advocate for, whether they're effective or not. Another thing that's really helpful is sales confidence in general. And the best salespeople that I know when they come to my house or when I have a chance to observe really good salespeople, um, when they're called, they assume the client wants to work with them. And the, the way that I've heard some people put it is if they didn't want to work with me, they wouldn't have called me, right? They wouldn't have called my the, this company if they didn't want to work with us. And so that sort of assumption that the client is going to want to buy so long as you address their concerns and you move forward, rather than constantly always kind of proposing or selling as though it's a question, right? Now, again, there are lots of questions, but those questions are specific to the client's needs. You're thinking about what the client needs, what the client wants. You're addressing their needs. You're not just trying to sell them a product. And again, that's a really key thing there, but always, always solving their problem, always providing what they're expressing. And just with that assumption, with that confidence that if you're able to do that, uh, and you should be, that the client is going to buy from you. And that's something that I, that I see work really well. And it's not an overconfidence. It's not a cockiness. It's just like, hey, I'm here. 
Uh, we're going to work through this, and at the end, uh, I'm, I'm just sort of assuming that we're going to that we're going to buy. Now, again, I'm not doing the traditional just assume the sale and all that kind of traditional sales talk. It's a confidence thing. It's just a confidence thing, and that's all that I'm promoting here. And it's something that a lot of times technicians lack. And it's a social thing, uh, and it's something that you probably should work on. The next is build your technical expertise. There are very few regular field techs out there, installers or, or service techs, who are really good at the building science and the design side. And I would encourage you to get good at that stuff. So take some classes, um, get some, make sure you have the right software, manual J, S, and D, the ACA manuals. Um, of course, you know Alex Meany is my favorite uh, educator out there. You can find him at Mean HVAC. He has really great courses online for that. Um, strongly encourage you to get really good at equipment sizing, equipment selection, so load calculation, equipment selection, and duct design. Uh, designing in terms of BTUs and CFM, but then also designing for the ducts themselves. And that's where Quick Model comes in really handy, that 3D design suite. It's Quick Model with a K. Um, I would encourage you to become familiar with those softwares. Again, most technicians are not going to be doing a lot of work on those softwares. And in sales, I think you should at least know something about it, even if you have an internal design team who's going to end up doing a lot of that for you would also encourage you to brush up on your building science. Um, that's you know the HVAC grapevine guys. Um, there's a lot of really great people, TEC, NCI, um, a lot of really great content out there to brush up on your building science knowledge. Performance contracting is a really great thing to know about. Even if you are swapping boxes a lot of the time, we still do. Knowing when to switch the conversation and say, hey, you've got a problem that's in need of some significant alterations, not just doing it like for like equipment sale. Again, this is everything from what we talked about duct design, um, air balance, airflow, pressure, insulation, even things like control layers in the walls, understanding these basics, even if it's just the basics. Uh, every salesperson uh, who's selling, at least in residential, should know something about that uh, if they're going to successfully solve clients' problems. Learn how to use me the measurement tools. Use things like blower doors, precision manometers, true flow grid, airflow hoods. Uh, these are all things that will allow you not only to solve problems, but it will help you demonstrate to the client that you know what the heck you're doing. And I think in your basic process, again, each market's going to be a little different what your priorities are, but in your process, I would always deploy some instruments, whether that's thermal imaging or whether it's you know duct leakage testing or whether it's a blower door or whether it's true flow grid or whether it's a combination of all of the above if you're obviously getting really deep into it. And usually at that point, the client's going to need to pay for that. But deploying some technology in your sales uh, really demonstrates to the client that you're going above and beyond what anybody else is gonna do. Um, I would also strongly encourage you uh, to embrace the dirty work of sales. So getting into crawl spaces, getting into attics, confirming you know, all those hard things to confirm like ducting uh, and making sure that you don't have any significant leaks, even if it's just a visual inspection, uh, making sure that things are strapped properly and sizing and all that really demonstrates to the client that you're taking the extra step, but also often will help you catch things and will build respect with your installation teams and your leadership as well. As always, in sales, you need to hone your communication skills and communication starts with being a good listener and asking the right questions. So again, first you ask the right questions, then you're a good listener. Uh, and that is really the main thing to be a good salesperson. You can be an introvert, you can be an extrovert. If you're an introvert, you may have to learn how to talk a little more than you're comfortable with. If you're an extrovert, you're gonna need to learn to talk a little less than you're comfortable with. Uh, regardless, the goal is to ask good questions and listen for those answers for the client so that you can provide insights to serve their needs, not just sell them products. Understanding empathy, practicing empathy is huge. Being able to kind of meet that client's energy, but without coming at it from a passive uh, or a unconfident uh, mindset. You want to come across as confident. You want to come across as appropriately assertive about what you can provide, what the organization you work for can provide but you want that to come across as clearly empathetic. And that starts with listening and being able to kind of match that client's ener energy and understand what their priorities are, because it's gonna change. It's gonna change from client to client and you need to be able to flow with that. For gosh sake, maintain integrity. Um, as soon as you get the opportunity to start to do anything commission-based, um, there's always a massive opportunity to prioritize the wrong things and start to take advantage of people. And the biggest thing is that you always need to make everything right because you will make mistakes, right? And if you're the type of person who owns everything you do, takes responsibility, when the client calls, you pick up the phone, when there's a problem on the install, you show up, when there's a problem after the install, you show up, that's what a really good salesperson does because you care about the result. You can be an expensive contractor. You can make a lot of money, that's fine. 
but you should be delivering better quality if you're charging more. To me, that is sort of implicit. So whenever there's these companies that are charging you know, these massive you know, per install tickets, that's my first question is, are you really providing industry leading excellent quality? And does, is the client making that connection or are they been led to believe that that's just the price? And again, that's where I get a little bit concerned sometimes. And again, we're not talking about competing with chucking a truck or somebody who's not licensed. We're talking about reputable companies. You know that in your market right now, there are probably companies that are charging two, three times what everyone else is. They're taking the approach of market really heavily. When you get a lead, you just basically, you do everything you can to close that lead. And then you know a lot of times those same companies are not providing very good service. You have to be the one who owns. If you told the client something, that the company that you work for is providing that to the client. It's really, really important that you do that. That's your own personal integrity. So take that really, really seriously. Final tips. Yeah, ask for feedback. Shadow people. Um, shadow good people. If you're working with somebody and you start to get that kind of sleazy feel, uh, move on. Work with somebody who really cares about the client. That's how they talk. They're very interested in providing solutions to the client. They're interested in design. They're interested in building science and building for performance. That doesn't mean they have to be only a performance salesperson, right? But they care about that stuff. They want to solve humidity issues. They want to solve filtration issues. They're not just interested in jamming a box and in making the most money they possibly can and moving on. People who care about the outcomes for their clients, those are the people you want to listen to. Gain the confidence that they have. Learn how to ask good questions. Learn how to listen really well. Learn how to slow down when you need to slow down. Learn how to speed up when you need to speed up. And finally, Follow a set process. Once you establish a process, follow that process. There will be exceptions where you have to go outside of the norm. That's okay. But rinse and repeat. Follow a process. That will make sure you don't miss things. Checklists are great. Um, make sure that you're not getting sloppy, especially when you get busy and excluding the design part or not or failing to have the necessary conversations you need to have with the client to make sure they're getting what you promised them. Those are all really important things. And following a process really, really helps with that. So that's it. That was kind of like a more broad sales thing. What do you do to be a service technician and make that transition? Well, you develop these skills. You commit yourself to it. And you have to know that you actually want to do it. Uh, there's other types of sales other than residential in-home selling. That's what I primarily talked about. There are things like um, B2B account management and commercial sales. Very different set of skills. Um, I look at my buddy Jordan Cummings, uh, who used to be with Dyke and he's with Train nowadays. Uh, and he's been on the podcast before. He's one of my best examples. So if you want to Look him up on the internet and bug him for some advice on that front. I'm sure he would just love that. Um, but in all seriousness, there's a lot of really great people out there who do sales at all different levels. And the ones who are really successful have a really good reputation in all corners. Nobody's going to be universally loved by everyone. I, I know I'm not. But if a good salesperson does a good job and keeps their promises, then people are going to speak highly of that person. And that's the type of person you want to learn from. All right. Thanks for listening. Hope that helps. Thanks for watching. If you're willing, give this video a thumbs up and drop us a comment. Don't forget to hit that bell icon to stay updated with all of our future videos. And as a quick reminder, HVAC School isn't just a YouTube channel. Dive deeper with us at our main website, HVACRschool.com. Curious for more knowledge on the go? We've got you covered. Tune into the HVAC School podcast available on all your favorite podcast apps. And while you're at it, join our thriving Facebook group. Also, don't miss out on our free mobile applications available for both iPhone and Android. We're all about community. Vortex. Bytex.